today we're going to talk about remote working as the main topic because Juliana recently uh, made quite a bit of news when she took her company fully remote and this happened in August 2023. Right, so uh, maybe just to start, Juliana, could you tell us about your company and what you do and how big is your company? Well, I guess to start, I want to share that I am a scientist turned entrepreneur. In 2018, I started my own company called Wild Type Media Group and we publish books, magazines, social media, etc. And we were always kind of an office bound, in person company. And all of that changed, of course, in the pandemic, mm. when we had the circuit breaker in Singapore in March 2020, mm. and we went remote. So fast forward to August 2023, which, as you mentioned, I decided to end my lease and truly, truly go remote. So it was just nice at August 2023 that your lease was ending anyway. Yes. So it was a bit of a kind of like fates were aligned kind of thing, like it was going to happen, then you, it made you think about it. La. Well, that, that's the short story. Uh. But that's a longer story because if you think about it, some of us who are a little bit older still remember the SARS crisis. And if any of you recall, the worst case scenario we all predicted was a three-month mm, yeah. circuit breaker. Right. That's the worst case scenario. Yeah. We weren't thinking three years, guys. Yeah, yeah. So all we were thinking of is, okay, great, we work from home for three months. And it so happened, uh, Wei Chun, that my, as I mentioned, August, right? So I had to renew my lease in 2020. So I talked to all these, you know, cool entrepreneurs and CEOs who have a lot more experience than me. They run like giant teams, like thousand people. Mm. And they all said, okay, we're going to go through a three month SARS-like crisis. Right. And then the economy will bounce back mm. ferociously. Mm. And you got to get prepared because mm. you, you're not going to like shrink. You got to get ready, you got to even double up. Right. So nobody thought it was going to last three years. Mm. So instead, I took a bigger office lease. I renovated it. It cost me um, 30000 just to get it into a shape that I like, you know, glass office, studio with soundproof walls, laminated floors in anticipation of that bounce back. But it didn't happen because mm. Delta... Omicron. Mm -hmm. So it got more and more and more remote for me to the point that that so-called you know, renovated office was more or less unused for about mm. three years. Mm. So that's the long story. Wow. Yeah, because I remember visiting then and even then it was like, wow, got a lot of things. Y'all got recording studio, everything, but nobody yeah. around. Uh, uh, it was yeah. very empty and it was like that throughout the whole three years. Lah. I would say so. We, we, because we do have magazines, so we have to come and pack it. Mm. But we're talking about maybe six times a year, mm. 12 times a year. So it became a warehouse. Pretty much a warehouse. Mm. Wow. So when you made the jump to go like full in, fully work remote, right? Or work from home, right? Mm. Fully work from home. Is that what you call it? Or work from anywhere? I, I call it uh, remote work. Re fully or remote work, work. work. Flexible work. Flexible work. from work. anywhere. W-H-A. Right. So when you made that jump, was it jarring to you and your colleagues? Okay, you're asking a, a very uh, sensitive question for many people because uh. there's always that employer versus employee, um, you know, conflict, right? Yeah. But actually, I, the more I think about it, even though I'm an employer and a founder, I'm also an employee of my own company. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, remote work is liberating. Yes, remote yes, work yes. is the best thing that was invented since sliced bread. <laughs> <laughs> because you see, let me explain, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I have two kids and I would love to spend more time with them. Mm -hmm. I love having not to, you know, you have to change into my clothes, put on my makeup. That at least takes 30 minutes to an hour. And then you have to decompress after you reach home, mm -hmm. travel, of course, you know, buy lots of clothes or uh, queue up for lunch, you yep. know, coffee breaks, everything. Yep. I save pretty much two to three hours a day. So I love remote work. Do you know, if you think about saving two hours a day, that is 10 hours a week. Mm. So you actually work one day less, guys, if you work remote. Yes, I remember seeing you do a calculation on, on a post. Uh, I think it yes. might be LinkedIn. Yeah, that right? went viral. Um, yeah. To cut the long story short, you save one month of your life. Every year? Every year. Wow. So it is at least from the employee side. La. If you Everybody are a remote la. worker. Yeah. Right. Because yes. employer also employee. I guess. But I mean, I'm also, yeah, we are all employees. But I guess like them. the usual employer argument would care about like, yeah, I mean, you save time. But yes. How much of this time is going to being more productive at work? Yeah. So that will, you know, we are going to go into a different, uh, a, a, a okay. kind of a, a different area, which is productivity and, you know. Yeah. Mm. Output. 
outputs right. you know stuff like that but I, I mean you seem like a pretty progressive employer mm. so you probably will not tie how hard people are working to actually like productivity because you know time spent doesn't always equals productivity right it's so, so Rin Ming you talked about productivity and I think there is uh, it's very important for us to clarify there are two different ways of looking at productivity so there's the employee productivity yay sure. I save one day a week mm-hmm. save a lot of money I can cook healthy lunches I can go to the gym or take a run you know, all of this is making me feel more productive. Yeah. I can finish my work in a shorter amount of time. And because I don't commute, I'm definitely more productive because mm. you can finish eight hours of work in eight hours, not 10 hours where you mm-hmm. have commute time. Mm. But you also have to look at the output mm. of, the, of that person as part of a team and part of a company. Mm-hmm. And there are studies, unfortunately, by some of the top researchers at Stanford, mm. specifically one guy called Nicholas Bloom, mm-hmm. who is the leading voice of remote work research that shows productivity of remote firms are lower by 10 to 20 percent. So productivity in this case, in this study, is measured output. as output. Mm. La. So mm. just the raw amount of work that is done. Uh, I wouldn't say raw, but whatever the output is measured. They did studies, uh, not, not this specific researcher, but he cited studies that other researchers did on Fortune, a Fortune 500 Companies. company that had an in-person data, data center, mm. uh, call center, and a remote call center. Mm. In April 2020, the in-person call center went remote, and they could compare it as a delta, right. as well as use the always remote call center as a control. Right. Because yep. you know we, are, we were all traumatized by the pandemic, mm-hmm. so certainly everyone's productivity dropped. But that yeah. is a is used as a control to yes, standardize. Yes, yes. So after standardizing, they found that the in-person to remote call center had a, um, this, in this case, 8% drop in productivity. Wow. So why, do, okay, so why are we using call centers? Because we don't work in call centers, yeah. right? Mm. The, the challenge is that you need a lot of data points, mm-hmm. like thousands of people, yeah. and you need a before and after. Mm. So you need discrete output, which is a number of calls made, you know, customer satisfaction. Yep. So for you, the both of you, right, you don't have like 25 outputs a day mm-hmm. and there's not 10,000 of you. And it's creative work. Like, yeah, you don't have a, before and after. Yeah, yeah. So there's not enough data points. Yes, so yes. the best data can be done on a discrete like a call center? multiple right. outputs mm, a day yeah. and single unit yeah. output oh. like a call center. Right. And, yeah, yeah, and, and I guess like sense. for different companies, the output measure would be different. Also. Yes. Yeah, like, mm. I mean, so like knowledge yeah. workers have very different outputs, like yourselves, it's creative mm-hmm. output mm-hmm. versus uh, data, data call center. Yeah. I feel a lot more creative, innovative, and, and, and happy at home. So wouldn't my output be better, my productivity increase? But don't forget, businesses are stronger than solopreneurs and freelancers because of the teams. Mm. So, yes, you may feel individually more creative and happy, mm. but are you stronger as a team? The answer is probably no. Mm. Because right. there's isolation, there's silos, right. there's lack of communication. So you have to be very intentional, like, right. okay, let's meet mm. at 3 p.m. for a Zoom call. Huh. But I here you can, like, water cooler chat, yeah, you yeah. can go for lunch. Yes, yes. I guess it's like an LDR versus a normal relationship. Uh, right. Probably. Yeah. Also, like, really. Some people yeah. will not want an LDR because there's distance, it's yes. inconvenient, you have to put in special effort. Okay. to keep it going as compared yeah. to a normal relationship. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's kind of like that with remote work also. But you just LDR with a lot of people and you all don't do, you know, stuff that people typically don't do in... Right. Yeah. Typically do in relationships. Yeah. So given this, like, very statistical 8% drop, like, do you still think it's worth it that you went fully remote? For me, you know, it's non-negotiable now after the pandemic mm-hmm. that I be there for my kids when they come off the school bus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want to be there even in the morning when they go to, to go to school. I want to be there for them when they have we have dinner to, and mm-hmm. have dinner together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if these are my non-negotiables, yeah. then I feel that you I want to firm it. that that right. does that as well. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Even so, if it comes at a potential. Right. A little and, bit of a And don't loss forget, of in the pandemic, I started hiring overseas. Mm. Uh, so I have colleagues in Malaysia, uh, in the Philippines, and in right, India. Right, right. So it's kind of now it's going to be like the office class versus the remote class. Mm, yeah. I, I felt that there'd be no point going to an office. I think many of you have experienced this. Mm-hmm. You go into an office only to Zoom with your colleagues. Many wow, people tell that's me. That's so that, depressing. You know that, right? Yeah. It happens all the time yeah. now. Yeah. Wow. So, so maybe let's go to the remote thing later, like the mm. fact that you're hiring overseas. But I'd like to go back to two points that I thought was very interesting. The first one being that 
as an employer, you are also oftentimes an employee as well. Yes. And I think that's the way that we think about our office because we only have four people, la, so it's a bit harder to, mm. to apply to all companies. I too also have a very small team, you know. Right. I'm now 18, so... Right. Um, 18 is still, to us, is big. La, you know? It's all relative because right. I just had lunch with my friend who has a 3,000 person I mean, oh, okay, team, yeah, right? So another, like, I felt, I, oops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so how we do it is that we used to work from home one day of a week. Mm. Now it's turning into two days of a week. So mm. Wednesdays and Fridays we'll work from home. And the thought from that actually just came from Remy and I like, we also don't want to, like our office hours have always been very like, chill. like mm. very chill. Like just come here by 10.30 and you can leave at 5.30. To a lot of people they're like, oh, then do you have time even? But mm. it's like, I don't want to wake up too early, rush and peak hour and then also transport cost if you're taking a cab is more when it's peak hour mm. it's slower you have to stand mm. it's not as enjoyable so I'm thinking if I want to extend this to myself I think it will be fair to run the firm like that for that to mm. be my culture I don't mind having a small drop in productivity because mm. I also want this to be an enjoyable place so now I find that when we come to work we might get less done than if we just stayed at home honestly mm. but it's nice to be with people it's more social right yes, it's more yes, for yes. community for for bonding just like vibes collect the vibes and vibes can be profitable too it's just not as measurable or as immediate but I think it's worth it it makes it fun for me to come to work mm-hmm. so I read in this book uh, by Daniel Priestley that there are three kinds of teams so there's the solopreneur maybe you and your BFF run a company like how you begin and then there's a lifestyle business which is what you're approaching a lifestyle business is somewhat like a team of say 5 to 12 you know Mm. Kind of everyone knows everyone. They're all direct report. There's mm. no, they're all direct it's to the flat, boss. Yeah. It's very flat. Mm. Flat. There's no hierarchy, and then the next jump, which is maybe uh, thirty five and beyond, so twelve to thirty five and thirty five to beyond, mm. we are approaching a performance business. Mm. A performance business, which is a scale, a scalable business, mm. has multiple hierarchical layers. Mm-hmm. So there's you, the C suite, so called, yeah. and then there's the middle manager, mm. yeah. and then there is a direct reports, which are the executives. Mm. If you run your current business like you do right now, it's called a lifestyle business, which is actually what the way I run it as well. We can afford to have a lot of flexibility. Right. But when you actually start scaling beyond 35 packs, if you do that, you're going to see a lot of crazy things happen. Yes, yes. Because, yeah. guys, I, I did that interview with CNBC when I went remote and this journalist said I want to interview you and I said oh talk, talking head she said, yeah. no I want to write a story on you I said dude why is it so interesting it's been three years in the pandemic right. and she said actually I'm writing more remote stories than ever you know uh, so uh, in, in, after I, the story was published Wei Chun there were so many DMs First of oh. all, I got hundreds of CVs. Sorry, I cannot employ any of you. <laughs> that was crazy. Like, hundreds of CVs came in. Okay, thank you for your interest in my firm. I well, cannot really? reply all of them. La. Cannot. Too many, really. uh, I, I understand that there's appeal. But, but you should hear the other side of the story, guys. Okay. This, is, this is, I have not talked about this, which is all the entrepreneurs sharing their horror stories. Mm. Mm. I think, I think it makes sense because like mm. if it's a small team it's easy to QC the people it's yeah. easy to do like a quality qual- yeah. check to make sure that like, there are no weirdos right yes yeah. like once you <laughs> exceed a certain number you, you agree what I'm saying you yeah. can QC yeah, your two yeah. colleagues I mean, four people yeah. the, the moment somebody is not pulling their weight like, ah, you I can feel it, it yeah. because it's obvious yeah. if it's like 25 people in the team it, it might like be 50, harder to spot you know? yeah, yeah, and like then like 100. the more the, the more number you, you hire the more yeah. percentage of okay then, then like let's say there are 5% weirdos in the world out there, right? Mm. And you hire 100 people, then there'll be 5 weirdos. It, it's, it's not even the weirdos which are yeah. pretty bad. Yes, yeah. I, I wouldn't want a weirdo on my team. You know, there are people who work extremely well in an in-person office and are completely gone mm. in a remote office. Like, you never saw from them again, never heard from them again. And right. they collect a paycheck every month. Yeah. And then they said, you know, I, I just didn't understand this was my best employee. Mm. And suddenly they were gone. You know why? In my story, I said there are two non-negotiables for a good remote worker. Uh You must be a strong virtual communicator. Mm. So if I message you, Wei Chun, and I'm your supervisor, you have to respond. Of course. But some people don't respond. It's just not natural to them that virtually I will do that. Yeah, or like someone's having a virtual birthday party on Slack. Mm. They will be like, they will never... Don't show up. They don't like happy birthday. Yeah, they don't show up. So they they disappeared from sight. Mm. Or there is a deliverable that's one week from now. Mm. They will disappear for a week. And then they will deliver it, but it's, it could be wrong. 
So oh. a, a good virtual worker will be like, check hey, in. what do you mean? Draft uh, one. I, I, just, I just thought you could check out what I've been doing. Yeah. It's more like it, iterative, la, right? Yeah, it's, it's so they have like, to yeah. be like in an office, but virtually. You mm. can do that on Zoom, on Slack, WhatsApp, I don't know. TikTok, you can. Because yeah, in a physical office, you would naturally, you would naturally have opportunity. Do that. Like you walk around the table, hey, I notice you're doing this. Can I yeah. Have a look? Then yeah. It just happens. So a strong virtual communicator. That's the first one. Is is uh, important. The second one mm. is a uh, high, strong and high accountability, mm. because you see in an office, guys, you can see what your supervisor or your supervisee is doing. Mm. Is there such a word, supervisor? Supervisor, yeah, also like. <laughs> a direct oh, report we get it, like, yeah, 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 yeah. But <laughs> if if remote, you can't see. So a a highly accountable person will do the right thing even when nobody's watching. Right. Mm. Yeah. So are you? Do you hire a giver or a taker? Mm. Because a giver will keep on giving when nobody is looking, mm. but if you hire a taker, the moment nobody is watching them, they will take. The take, yeah. So that's yeah. like the second thing that is required for wow. a strong worker. So back to the the DMs I got. Mm. Uh, I've heard so many horror stories and actually these employees were traumatized mm. because they have to pay the bills and it's not, you know, yeah, it's not working. It's like being right? taken for a ride. So sometimes there's a lack of trust. You know, I, I get lots of DMs from uh, nice people, mostly women telling me, oh, you know, uh, my employer doesn't trust me. You know, I think it's, it's unfortunate because most of us are trustworthy. Mm. We want to do the best we can. We are givers. But there's always these well, bad takers eggs. in the world. Yeah, the yeah, takers yeah. Mm. are spoiling the market. Yeah. They're making our life. That's why the RTO exists. Return to office. Right. It's, to, it's for that 10%, 20%. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think you can't uh, completely filter out a reality where there are no takers. So I think as a business, you mm. just have to mm. deal with the fact that these things will come. So it makes sense, right? The lifestyle yeah. versus performance. Mm. Absolutely. So yeah. now you get why like, companies have to bring them back. Absolutely. Because after a certain point, you cannot manage all these people. Mm. Oh, and another reason why remote is less productive, um, there is one group of people who are the saddest <laughs> in a remote environment. You want to guess who? The extrovert people. Uh, mm, okay, that, that is more like a social. social. I, mm. I get it. I agree. I'm an extrovert. I think the natural givers, maybe the people who automatically always like update people and be very diligent. Sure, sure. They feel a sense of isolation. It's true for everyone, even introverts, by mm. the way. Actually, it is the middle managers because they have to manage both sides but with no visual input. Mm. So they have to deliver the same productive productivity and points and outcomes to their bosses, right, as before. And they have to manage a bunch of people whom they can text and have no response by oh. from. They have to manage people who maybe have a week, a one week to deliver the output, mm. but one week later has gives something that is right. completely wrong. So they have to maintain the output, but the observable data point is like something. And there are people, you know, playing really. cat and mouse game with them, mm. right. hiding from sight, not responding right. to emails, responding to messages. Mm. I mean, I know employers who message and don't get responses for three hours. Wow. You, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the middle manager has to make all of them abide by the same company rules that we had in person, mm. deliver the same output to the boss and keep everyone happy, not burning out and collegiate and uh, keep the community from you know, staying focused and not getting disengaged. Mm. And you know there are lots of people who are disengaged. Yeah. 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 In, even yeah. in an in-person company. Yeah, yeah, that's mm. true. If, I'm a, if you're a rem middle manager, a remote company has more challenges for you than an in-person company, if you ask me. You so do you do those things like, uh, like some companies I heard from my friends like, they say you gotta switch on your app webcam or you yeah. work. They, they even have like a, a typing time. a typing yeah, yeah, uh, sensor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing work. So there's even like TikTok videos on how to fool these devices. Oh, yeah, of course. They make something shake every five to so ten minutes. So do you do that? Like do that, do that, you do see, that, kind of that stems from a lack of trust. The fact mm. you did that, like someone checking your phone means they don't trust you. Like but I think from from these some of these employees' perspective, it could also be that I need some SOPs so that I can establish trust first. Mm. So it, maybe it's just separate from you where they want you to prove first, then I trust you. Instead, I trust you first, I, I, then you break. I think it should be the other way. You always right. start from trust until proven otherwise. If not, life is too hard to live. Yeah, you I always know. like cannot sleep at night, full of anxiety. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to, to be fair also, like my friends who told me about all these things, none of them are happy about it. No. They're not like, hey, so cool. They track when I'm working. They just like, hey, You yeah, know how I do it? Uh, first of all, you have to let go. 
My mom always asked me because my mom used to work in retail. She said, "How do you know everyone is working?" Yes, yes, yes. So yes, yes. I, she she really she still asked me this three yeah, years later yeah. <laughs> all the time. I said, "You it's not like you, that anymore. You hope that they're working. Wow. You hope that they're working. You, they're working. you believe that they're working. Yeah. But this is how I think of it, Richun. I've thought about this. First of all, I had to let go. Mm-hmm. I had to let go of the control." Expectation. If not, I wouldn't enjoy remote work, mm. right? I'll be anxious. Yes, yes. Right. The the, the second thing is I have an awesome group of uh, team leaders right. who I know are setting the right expectations. Mm. Yeah. The moment you have one low performer, uh, who you who, who you allow to persist, mm-hmm. it yes. spreads. Yes, yes, It yes, infects yes. the whole team. Because everybody else was working hard, but they will hey, feel like a. Hey. Hey. Mm. Right, then not fair. Yeah. It's like broken glass, work. broken window theory, right? Yes. Someone fucks so up, then everyone else everyone has permission to fuck up. Yes. Yeah, so you have to make sure that you treat fairly the ones who work hard right. by eliminating those who are not playing ball. Mm. That's the first thing. Second thing is twice a year performance review. Mm. I do twice a year. Mm. Um, in fact, I used to do once a year until I learned that in the big Fortune 500, they're now going to four times a year. Four mm. times a year. Yeah. So yeah. I said, oh my God, SME cannot be so old-fashioned. Yeah. So I went to two, two times a year. And I, I look at the output, you know, aggregate. And you can see for yourself who has been pulling. You can really see. Mm. Six months is enough to see output. Right. If you say one day, not fair, right? Mm. One right. week, also not fair. Right. Mm. Six months is fair. Right. Yeah. Huh. It's very obvious, guys. Right, right, right. It's very obvious. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting to hear because we have such a small company that it's often just very clear to us immediately. Yeah. So the idea of doing it at scale, I would think the bigger you grow, the bigger, the more spaces and gaps there are for people to hide. You know? so, so, so if you, if you want to use, I want to f- continue what you said. Yeah. If that's the case, then so what? Right, right, if, right. Yeah, if I'm a high performer and I can do it in two hours, it takes you eight yeah. mm. and everyone's happy. Yeah. So uh, I'm not saying, see, that's a given and taker again. Yeah. I have people who are that great in my company. And even mm. though they could do it in two hours, they'd be like, hey, I'm, I've got capacity. Mm. Mm. Can I help you? They will naturally Yeah, you see what to. I mean? Right, right, right. So first of all, so what? Mm. If they can deliver the output, so what? It's, your, it's, it's good that right? you, you, your experience led you to this date. But if you hire a giver, they'd be like, hmm, who can I help now? Right. What can I do to value right, add right. because I'm done? Yeah. Mm. And I might even think that actually if your company has a culture of being trusting upfront mm. like that, you might be able to attract more givers naturally. Yes. Versus like on the upfront, like you come in then like wow, well, actually in the interview they'll tell you, Oh, we'll actually lock your keyboard movement. You need yeah. to be in the webcam. Then I got now offer I go over there instead. You know? yeah. So it's like a cycle almost. You yeah, like you read being, being nice is a great way for SMEs to attract talent. I, right. I would say so yeah. because if you think about it, you know, given that we are all SMEs here, I think SME was the, the, the number of people to dis- define the SME. She's quite crazy. I think it goes up to 500. <laughs> or but that's more like M that's already, small, right? We are yeah. S. That's medium. Yeah, we are medium small, large, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tiny, <laughs> me, small, micro, medium. Micro, micro, yeah. Yeah. micro, micro <laughs> business. Yeah. Um, I, I think that we have a lot of disadvantages when it comes to uh, MNC. MNC. Mm. So I used to have a mentor who, who is uh, one of the APEC head of a very famous big tech company. And he gave me a lot of advice because I said, I cannot compete against you. If you make an offer on any of my staff, yeah. they will all leave mm. me for yeah. you. Mm. Then actually he disagreed with me. He said, Juliana, that's because you're going head on with me. Mm. Ah, this is a really, really eye opener for mm, me. Mm. Is it if you go head on with me, you lose. Uh. You will lose yeah. because I have this. I have a barista. Mm. I have lunch. Barista. Yeah, yeah. I don't have a band to play right. music for them on yeah. sun, on Friday night. You know, yeah. you have nothing. Uh, he didn't say it like that. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm God, paraphrasing. Yeah, yeah. But, but I heard saying it. It kind of like narrows down the list of who the company. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah but yes, okay, yes, don't, don't like say four of them. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Okay. you can think of. So uh, then he said, but you can look for people who value your lifestyle, which mm. I can't give. Right. So they're all RTO already, sure. you know. Um, they, they have Zoom calls, guys. I'm talking about like, I know all some of these tech yes, companies yes. because they have, to, they, are, they have Australia, they have Europe, and they have US. So they have calls maybe 8 p.m., 10, 10 12, yes, 2 a.m., even yes. 4 a.m. Yep, yep. And then they start again at 9. Mm. So it's nonstop. It's, uh, so yeah. if you want a six-digit, you know, 100K salary, he will provide it. Mm. Right. But in my case, I offer you freedom, I offer you 6 p.m. and we're out. 
because mm. I'm out, you're out. I don't want to get emails from yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. I offer you, <laughs> a, the one. you know, benign neglect. <laughs> yes, yes. Benign neglect. Benign neglect. Yeah. I like yeah. that. Wow. Yeah. If yes, you're sir. a creative, I worked with some of my creatives for years. They said the best thing I like about you, Juliana, because they worked in other agencies, yeah. is you let me do what I do. Mm. I said good because I I could not design yeah. so to save my life. Now, right? Yeah. If you choose green and I prefer blue, I would think probably you're right. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the only thing I might ask for is a bigger logo. Right, right. <laughs> that's fair. I that's think like that's a classic, fair. That's a creative. Yeah. That's a classic client bigger. request. Yeah. 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 Not for me, the client will prefer. But, but I think what's happening now, in, at least in the Singapore market, is like a, a lot of employers who should be nice to their employees, should mm. be more flexible, should be more, you know, uh, progressive. Mm. They're actually the ones that are very, very traditional, even more traditional than all these like big MNCs that are yeah. being progressive. Fair enough. And that affects like the talent that, that they get. Mm. And sometimes I think that uh, you see a lot of complaints about SMEs online. Mm. I, I think it makes sense yeah. because, mm. because the SME cannot afford to pay. Mm. Then the people that eventually go there are people who, you know, Cannot get a lot of other things. Yeah, cannot get other so you ones. get what you yeah. give. Uh. So, yeah. Yeah, so in the end, like, they... M- M- MFEO. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Then they meet in the middle and then they fight about each other. It's like plan C's meeting so plan it's, C's. It's so it's a yeah. bit of supply and demand, right, yeah. guys? Yeah, in the end of the day, you get what you give or you, you, it, it, the equilibrium always is reached yeah. Yeah. at the end of the day. You yeah. get what you are. Yeah. yeah. They say if you want to attract a good partner, you have be to good. be the good partner. Yes, yes, so it's a bit of, of both. But, oh. but maybe in defense of, of this class of, of SME employers, mm-hmm. um, can I also just you know, be fair and say, you know, some of them don't have the kind of training mm. that MNCs can provide to the employers. So that, you know, the best practices, HR practices. Right. So I think there is also a room for all of us to improve yes, mm. and yes. learn best practices like yes. from the Swiss you know, they are really yes. good. Some of the European companies, uh, Japanese companies, American. You know, there are, there's room for us to improve right. and learn best practices. Yeah, yeah, I mean, of course, I, th- I think there are very good reasons why these companies might be more traditional mm. in that way. Mm. But then, it, you must also acknowledge that it does have an impact mm. on what actually have plays out in real life. Actually, I have this uh, crazy, bizarre uh, theory. Mm. You want to hear? Yeah, yeah. So, I read online, actually on your blog, I see a lot of, I don't know how you guys do it, but strong mental health. Oh. Uh, so some people are very mad at SME owners and thank you guys for doing a huge service to Singaporean uh, knowledge, you know, trying to raise our financial knowledge. You're doing a great service. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Guys, you do not know what you have right here, okay? Not paid to say this. <laughs> So with regards to SME and employers, some people say, oh, my boss doesn't trust me to let me work remotely. But then at the same time, you know, so you want to work remotely. You don't want to work in the office. And then at the same time says, oh, we need to protect our jobs from being taken away mm. by foreigners. Mm, mm, mm. So you want your cake and eat it. Right, right. I just thought it's a little bit confusing because when I see their, their, their complaints and opinions, I said, guys, do you not realize how confusing it is to me to see you say both of these things. So if you don't want to go back to the office, you want to work remotely, which is fine, then be prepared to be disrupted by anyone yes, hungrier than you around the world. Yeah, so instead of being grumpy and angry at your boomer employer mm. who wants to see you in the office, mm. actually realize that could be an opportunity. Yes, that's your competitive advantage. That's your competitive yeah. advantage. You're, you are, you're living here. here. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's like, Guys, you, you, don't want, you want to work remotely and you don't want to yes, get disrupted by yeah. someone in another country around yeah. you. Mm. Make up your mind. Yeah, which one do you want? Right? Which one do you yeah. want? Yeah. You, you know, they have to pay 17 or now 18% more in CPF to hire you yeah. just to see you. Right, right. So yeah. isn't that your, your privilege? Because mm. if you work for an, another company overseas, yeah. they ain't got to pay you any CPF. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So it's just, yeah. it's just I, I got baffled. When I read it, what do you think? I know you have to respond. So. Well, I mean, sometimes you know, our usually usually replies like, "If you don't like the job, leave." Mm, right. Fair so enough. if they're already complaining about it long term, mm. it means that they don't have the ability to leave. They're probably mm. dealing with something something difficult, la, Which is why bigger. they, which is why they, they I don't want to say like skill issue, but that's mm. how the internet people will probably say like yeah. skill issue. Mm. They can't good. They can't go anywhere else, so they 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 are like projecting their energy in, in the comment section. I mean, which is totally understandable. But I have I have been that person before, so. Yeah. You know. So the best case scenario, right, Reming? is I can work fully remote and you only hire people from Singapore. Mm. That's not going to happen. Well, I mean... Right? Because uh, earlier on you mentioned like 
it's about ha- getting people like hungrier than you, right? Yes. Because that's where, where the regional competition is. But mm. it's also about hungry. I feel like it's just one aspect of it. Mm. You have to be higher up the, the value chain compared to you know someone in a yes. Yeah, because that's how you overcome the the, the hungriness. You don't need to be as hungry as someone from Indonesia or Vietnam, yes. but you do have to produce mm. enough output yes. to at least make sense for the employer. Yeah. Yeah. So that's our USP. Yeah. I think Wei Chun was talking about it in the WhatsApp, which is that is our USP. Yeah. Our you know education, yeah. multilingual, our our ability to follow yeah. SOPs and, and rules. Very organized. Work, yeah, and in this thing also is our ability to be present physically. Mm. Mm. So go back office. Mm. I mean, that's your USB. Yeah. So, so just now you mentioned that you hire people from overseas and, mm. and, and Singapore, of course. Mm. Tell us a bit about like, the remote worker part. Okay, because I'm a knowledge company where like yourself, we are mostly digital. In fact, yeah. I, I was forced to transition from a COVID. brick and mortar physical magazine company to a digital magazine company mm. so I, will, I have the benefit now of hiring people overseas yeah. uh, I just thought I should put a disclaimer out there this is not a cost issue it's not about money it's, it's more about access to talent mm. you are creative you know how much Singapore promotes literature design and arts right? it's not something that we support so it's very hard to find amazing creatives here mm. I can find some but not a lot mm. and ever since being able to hire from overseas I've widened my pool and I've discovered a huge number of amazing talented individuals who can write who can design who can come up with ideas that I, I surprises me even right now mm. you think mm. you can give like some examples of like where they're from what they do so okay I see so I have some colleagues in Singapore I also have some in Malaysia mm. Uh, Philippines and India yeah. and then once a year we meet up for our annual retreat so we just came back from Bali we had a three day two night retreat and we went to do yoga white water rafting yeah. a temple a visiting dinners you know we were all crying at the end so, Why? because it was Bonding fun trauma. yeah this is like the year before trauma we went crying. to Langkawi oh you cry it's funny because we see each other for the first time in a year oh, it was tears of joy yeah I, oh, I, I'm just curious like what is the role split like you know what I mean everything so I have five teams in case you're wondering um, I have my business team I call it business development team mm. I have my uh, Stratcoms team which is my marketing social media team I have a community team uh, which I call ecosystem and I have my publications team and then I have my design team so they, they can be from any country. Mm. So is it, but do you kind the of teams, cluster it by country? No, no, the teams, it, if it happened, it was not by, by plan. Oh. It can be anybody huh. anywhere. Mm. Mm. But is there like a trend, like, you know, for example? Or regional time zone. So if you re- refer your, your oh. friend to join, then you obviously might refer a friend in the same country, mm. but it was not intentional. Mm. And how do you go about like looking for this foreign hire? LinkedIn. Just LinkedIn? LinkedIn. Hmm. Or once you hire one, they can hire, they find their friends. So you ask them to, because people usually hang out with like-minded individuals. Right. So you hire a designer, you ask the designer to find another designer. I'm interested in the previous point also, because we are creative. So you said like mm. in Singapore, it's not about the money. That was an interesting point to me. It's because to, to me, that, that is the number one factor to go overseas. There's one factor. Because right. ge- geographical arbitrage, they call of it. Course. So you can use your high currency. Our cost is so high. That's one factor, so but not the only factor. Right. But, but you are saying like the, the, the sheer number of range of creativity that you can get overseas this is, is a, a lot this more. This is the whole world versus 3 million. Right, right. I know? mean, it's reasonable. Mm. But, but I think just to, to hear it would be mm. interesting also. Because I think there are very highly creative and talented people in Singapore. But I do also agree that if you are just to constrain your mm. your scope to this for all the kind of work that you might do. Because the kind of work we do is very specialised. Mm. Mine is even specific. more specialised, guys. Mm. You know, I do science. Right. And design or writing. Mm. You need mm. both... You need two of yeah. those things yeah. which are in itself hard to find. Yeah. Yeah, really. Individually are hard to find. Combined is even harder. Right. But I guess also your work can be more, I mean, doesn't need to lean on like elements of Singapore so often. That's why sure. your, your creators right. can be yeah. sure, sure. And I think that is true for a lot of uh, it's okay, but because original the content, roles, right? right? Yeah. The book salary man is a fair bit of local knowledge. I mean, a lot of it well, is, quite based, is, is yeah. based in yeah. Singapore. Yeah. But then I, I guess if you are creating, you know, Let's just say you're not like World Type Media for a while. Let's just say you're a marketing agency creating... Like LinkedIn-only content, right? Yeah. Or even like uh, FMCG stuff mm. for Southeast Asia. Mm. Then you don't necessarily need a Singaporean. True. Right? True. To have Singaporean knowledge or Singaporean True. background. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. 
Wow. So is there any difference in the way that you treat people who are in Singapore and people who are not in Singapore? Absolutely none. As exactly Absolutely the same. none. It's the same. I mean, the only difference is if you are based here, I might be able to bring you out for lunch. But wow. I brought people in from Isn't overseas. Isn't that favoritism? <laughs> no, I actually bring them in. They, they, if they're in KL, they just take a, a flight of course, over. Yeah, yeah, so right. easy. Right, then they hang right. out for two days and they go back. But is so it mostly regional also, or all around the world? Only four of countries. Four countries. Singapore uh. and the three other countries. Oh. So I, I recently brought my, my KL colleague and then mm. my Manila colleague. Mm. And next May, I really plan to bring my Delhi, New Delhi colleague mm. over. Mm. Because they are, they are here for different reasons. Sometimes it's uh, bonding. Sometimes it's strategic planning. Right. Sometimes they speak at our summits. Yep. So we run conferences for people in STEM. Right. Mm. Is it expensive to fly people in? Or is it from the money that you save from not having it, rental? It, it, I think it's, it's just necessity. You just spend because it's a part of your plan. Right. Mm. Maybe mm. It's, a, it's like an ex- expense. Like HR it's a fund. business expense. Right. I mean, yeah. HR is just fun for like bonding and right, right. Or, wellness. Or you can call thing, it right? like this, it's a business expense. Mm. Yeah. But what is the USP of a Singaporean worker like compared to a remote worker? Like for example, is it our command of English? You know, is mm. it our understanding of the the local scene if you're working with local is it our compliant culture is it like do you are you asking about Singaporean or Singapore Singaporeans so what about uh, PRs which one is PR yeah I'm PR la. Mm. I, okay, I well, consider Singaporeans PR. PR yeah Singaporeans and Singaporeans PRs right? PR, yeah. you know when, I, when you sent me that question I actually thought about it and I think it's actually very difficult to answer mm. I, I don't have an answer for that you know why because we are referring to Singaporeans as like a one block sure it's like a yeah. monolith, but we right. are very different. So maybe I, just for the sake of this discussion, I want to put it in two groups. Mm-hmm. Singapore and PR, la, uh, in two groups. Sure. There is the, the ones with the global mindset, mm. if you know what I'm getting at mm-hmm. and alluding to, and the like, right. like uh, he, he's right with you, yeah. yeah. Like the frog mindset. Yes, yes, okay? yes. No offense, just, just want to point out. Yeah. So does it mean you have to study or work overseas to have a global mindset? Absolutely no. not. I don't mm. mean it like that. I mean, do you see Singapore as the be all and end all mm. that you have to protect against everyone trying to enter? Yep. If that is the case, then you don't have a global mindset. Yep. And then there's other group, of course, which, okay, I understand that the world is porous. And even if I want to protect, companies can also have another team overseas. Yes, yes. So that group is, is, has a huge number of USPs. Mm. Yeah. You know, then I can talk about USP. I see. Mm. So I mean, you've talked about this before. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we have talked about this. I mean, like from my point of view, I'm, from my experience, mm. I think what I've noticed is that a lot of the in- intermediaries are like Singaporean. Like, mm. so Singaporeans tend to be like a lot of like project managers, yes, account uh, managers, yeah. like yeah. between middle uh, managers. Yeah, between like the creators and then like there will be some, mm. let's say Australia or something. Yeah. So because of the the language uh, mm. proficiency in English, mm. a lot of Singaporeans are the the middle ground mm. and they, right. they are able to communicate across different cultures so, so, so I was looking for something like that but I mean so you yeah. actually you hit the nail on the head that is our USP we are perfect hmm. middle, middle managers people, right? in an MNC right. and actually there's more than more than that it's, it's, it's actually like first of all geographically we are right in the middle of east and west yeah. mm. we have eastern and western yes. uh, 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 cultural references mm. like I grew up watching Friends you know the sitcom yes so I already kind of knew like oh at least on friends what the Americans like to do you know Hollywood movies but we also like Korean Japanese yeah. Chinese uh, uh, series so we are culturally bilingual mm. or multilingual yeah um, if you see the way our education system is run is the Cambridge education system mm. is actually from the industrial revolution yeah huh. so it's very organized you know the IB yes, system yes. international baccalaureate is completely different Hmm. It's project based, it's initiative, it's presenting. So the, the Cambridge system that we all were part of is all about you know getting really, really good and deep in one thing hmm. and just redoing it routinely and yep. repetitively hmm. and well. So because we are used to you know rule of law, yes. being very organized hmm. and being very step obedient. By step, SOP, so follow we everything. can yep. make things happen. That's hmm. great. We yeah. make things happen. And Believe it or not, MNCs just be- need a lot of people. Yes. Like, mm. If you do that, you can get paid like very well. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm not talking about like low paid wage. I'm talking about 300k a year. Right. That should be enough for everyone. I think that's that's, that's our USP. Mm. As as a Malaysian or as a non-Singaporean at this table, <laughs> I, I will completely agree. So that that a lot of people say like, our Singaporean 
like uh, the perception of Singaporeans to the Malaysian and, and my perception has always been it's not the kiasu kiasi stuff because Malaysia also quite kiasu I think it's more of the fact that I, I always think like Singaporeans are a bit more why I put it down is passive aggressiveness but what that is I think is more like sterility and the ability to take emotions out of the thing and like I think we, we met uh, we met an MP early on like when we started work and, and she said like um, what she thought was Singapore's strongest export is compliance Oh. Is that Singaporeans are great at following rules? Yes. And I've also heard like um, a previous boss of mine said that Singapore is like the Germany of Asia. Probably. Like, very standard, can follow. Very the, German, very Swiss a, also. Yes, yes, yes. right. And that's why we're the Switzerland of Asia. Yes, yes, exactly. So I think going like expanding beyond that to another question we wanted to ask mm. was like, um, maybe that answers it a bit, you know, like like. But but what are some of the good things that Singapore can export? This is a real main question. So yeah, I no, no, it's fine. I no, I think the question was more like, since now for some people, some like you know, in the value chain, right? Some of our jobs are being disrupted by people yes. from developing countries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what I'm trying to ask is like, what are the jobs that we can disrupt other people at? Oh. So, so, so you see, like last time, American manufacturing hub of the mm. world, Japan, you know, took that away. Mm. Now that Taiwan did that to Japan, then Singapore did that to Taiwan at some point. So, so, so I'm asking like. Who can we disrupt or like what kind of roles can we disrupt? Okay, if you're talking about the macro level, like macroeconomic level, uh, I, I'm not like, it's above my pay grade. Mm. But it's clear to see that we're doing going to high value, high knowledge industries like AI, data science and so on. Although that has another story because there are other countries that have massive AI workforces. Mm. Yeah. So definitely AI, we need to get into FinTech. that space. Fintech, blockchain, you know, you name it. Uh, all of those are, we don't need space for that. You just need knowledge, it's knowledge mm. based. Mm. And we are high knowledge uh, economy. Mm. So that's like the macro answer. Mm. But on the micro answer, I've got another one. Sure. Mm. Because I think we, all of us, should become entrepreneurs. Mm. You're talking to someone who was a government scholar and until 2018 was a professor, an uh, assistant professor in a medical school. If I, at the age of 35, can reinvent myself to become an entrepreneur running a media company of all things. You know, I was mm. a biologist, mm. drug delivery researcher. Anyone can do it. Okay, like not anyone. Not, 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 don't so, say no, all. Like, like, <laughs> okay, the, the, the sweeping statement rest scary. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, maybe like, there will be, there should Many be of you can 20% do it. more entrepreneurs, something okay. like that. Okay, this is why I think we should do it, okay? Yeah. Because it's so easy to start a company in Singapore. Yeah. You talk about advantage, right? Why can we disrupt? You can start a company in three days. It's like less than 100 bucks. If you mm-hmm. do it yourself, it's zero. Mm. It's like 15 bucks. Mm. And you can, you know, there's rule of law. There is uh, intellectual property yes. Protection. uh, protections. Yeah. Yeah. And people love to do business with yeah. Singaporeans because they know we won't run away with all their money. Mm. Yes. And people come to Singapore anyway right. because of F1 or something. So they love to visit us mm. and they see us as, as people who are legitimate. Trust, mm. Trustable. Uh, and, and then not only that, we can bring some of the ideas that we see in the West and bring it to the East mm. or things that work in the East and bring it to the West because mm. we are in the middle. Right. So we have so many advantages. Mm. And not only that, don't forget, as I mentioned, um, our, our currency is very strong. Yes, so yes. we can use that as geographical arbitrage yeah. and test our ideas out in the region mm. uh, using our strong currency. Right, yeah. yeah. yeah but absolutely. first you must have the global mindset. The global mindset, yeah. yeah. So we cannot see every change that happens to us as a, yeah. a, as a, as a assault. We have to ask ourselves, how can we make the best out of this? Mm-hmm. How, why do you think people don't get to have a global mindset? Uh, fear, I think uh, true fear, because, okay, I'll give you an example, right? Um, like when I was at 18, I had never, my parents are, you know, they didn't go to college, they are solopreneurs. My mom ran an a optical shop selling sunglasses oh, wow. in Lucky Plaza mm, wow. for 35 years. And I was a sales girl in her shop. So I had seen you know, generations of, of customers from all over the world. I've seen every ethnicity, every nationality, age group. And I've seen like some really terrible, you know, toxic and abusive. I've seen everything. Mm. So when I went overseas, um, I, I wasn't so like, raw but when i went overseas i had one specific mindset what i was trained to like i knew that the world ran in a certain way mm. and when i told people like a fact like, oh this is how things are done i have people laughing at me yes they're yeah. like you're, you're i mean they say words like you're silly juliana that's absolutely rubbish yeah, yeah. and then it completely like confounded me it's like cognitive dissonance mm. like what 
But that's how the way the world works. Mm. So this is what I mean by the global mindset. As long as you're willing to accept that the way you were brought up, mm. the things that you believe to be the holy grail, mm. it may not be true. Yeah. And you don't have to agree with me. It may me. not be true for everyone. Yeah, but yeah. at least mm. you're willing to listen. And yeah. say, could I be wrong? Yeah. Or is there another way to do it which mm. could be better? Right. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I share with you something a little bit vulnerable? Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, well, you're gonna share with like you know. Our yeah, followers. I, I want to share because so, Raming okay. actually Raming helped me a lot. So I did this podcast for myself about job hopping, uh, and then it was like, it went viral on TikTok and it went on Asia One, and then I asked Raming for help. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah I remember. It was earlier this year. Right? He did a Zoom call with me, <laughs> and he's like, "It's okay, Juliana. It's okay." So I I had a, a lot of time to reflect. So in my in my post, I said, "Why do people job hop?" Because I'm from a generation that. You know, mm. three to five years is a decent amount of time. Yeah. Even two to three years. But now I'm seeing cases like six months, right? One year. Um, and then after a lot of, of thought, right, Reaming, mm. I realized, why can't I change? Why, can't I, why, why is that bad? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Can I just shift my mindset and open mm. my mind? Mm. So after that, I went through a complete change in my mindset. I tell my, my Gen Zs, this is for Gen Zs, I say, I do not know how long you will stay with me, Mm. but I want you to know for the time you are with me, I will look after you as well as you can. And when you leave, I will support you. Mm. And I want you to stay in touch and don't be a stranger. I think that's the way. So it's like once you release the control and expectations, then everyone is a lot happier. Yeah, yeah. And then ironically, they stay longer. Mm. Yeah. I have them saying like two to three years. And I think, like you said, actually, this is the way to keep them. It's like you treat it so that their time in the company we will help you see it as a stepping stone to what you actually want. Yeah. I'm not going to assume that the work segment is your dream job. Mm. And, and, and I, I remember going for all these interviews in the past and it's like, the, the company will ask you, where do you see yourself in five years? The subtext being Another that, company. Yeah, you should, you should answer that, oh, I would have progressed within your company. But I mean, how often is that true? So it's, it's great that you, you can see that POV also. Because I think like, not to say that we are old, but I feel like, like when I tell my, my parents what we do for example for mm. work they're, they're worried because for their generation the most prominent factor when they considered work was stability that was the important thing for them so they don't see why I would eschew a good job opportunity with stability in a big company to start my own thing the, the thing for us I think is prominent in our generation is meaning mm. we want meaning and then I think guy. for Gen Z yeah Ikigai right and for Gen Z I think it might be a different thing altogether I don't know what it is my mm. feeling that is like freedom or sen- uh, flexibility. Mm. That's why job hopping is not such a big deal to them. Mm. They want to try things out and they're also still quite young. So it also shocked me la, because I, I would like, I, I teach part-time at NTU. Then like, I'll ask them, like, what, what do you expect from remote work, coming back to remote work? And I would be so shocked that, that almost like 80% of them would expect to have like a three-day work week, you know, like mm. three-day work for an office. And I'm like, guys, this is not the reality. Yeah, probably. But it, it does shift a bit. Mm. And our office landscape has shifted a bit. Mm. And now we are seeing millennials, millennial employers kind of like conflicting with Gen Z employees already. We mm. see it. Mm. So it's in the way that we millennials also struggle with boomer bosses. So, so to, to add to not only the mindset shift, right? Mm. First of all, if you expect someone to stay two to three years mm. and they stay a year, you get disappointed. Yes. So the shift happens, okay, I don't expect you to stay. Right. Um, I, I just encourage you to and I would love for you to mm. right mm-hmm. the second thing is you got to set up your systems such that you don't expect them to only become productive after three years you know that in an employee life cycle oh, mm. right. sometimes the training in some MNCs take up to six months yep. mm-hmm. so if they leave in six months um, it's actually quite terrible for Both for the all the SOPs and right. the productivity yes, yes, so yes. I have other employers telling me you know they train someone for four months and they left Oh. At the end of the training mm. period, right, so right, they are very right. de- devastated because don't forget they have a trainer who has to train them, uh, usually the direct supervisor. So then they are back to square one. I mean, if you are a middle manager and doing that, you'll be very devastated too. Hmm. You know, it's not it's not just about it's not a judgment here. It's just it's just lost time yeah. and productivity. I think bringing back to it to remote work, I think mm. a, a lot of it is really empathy, understanding. Mm. Like I mean, earlier you talked about understanding. People's point of view from other parts of the sure. of the world, right? Mm. I mean, if you're if or generations, yeah, then if you want to yeah. succeed in the company, it's about understanding what your middle managers KPIs are, mm. what they want. Mm. That's how you can manage upwards. Mm. If you don't have empathy, or you only wanna you wanna like Chinese is a hands on 
zi chuang, right? Yeah. Only do your, <laughs> your own thing and like, <laughs> just <laughs> work your way. You don't really care about what other people think. Yeah. Then you won't, will never be able to see outside your... You only be able to think about yourself. And then you're screwed. Right? Actually, since we are talking cheng yi, right? Mm. Uh, my Chinese is not that good. But my mom always taught me one cheng yi that I use everywhere. is yi tui wei jing. Wow. It saved me so well in life. If, every, if you're ni heng chong zi zhuang, right? You keep banging against the wall. Yi tui wei jing. You take a step back, you take a step forward. Mm. So if, if this is not working, I always tell my, my managers who have client servicing mm. roles, if you're, you cannot just keep banging at a wall to get yeah. the deliverable. You need to take a step back and take a detour and try to find another route right. around the rock. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. And, mm. and I guess many Singaporeans are feeling stuck mm. because of, I mean, they've been trying like the same thing mm. over and over again for the, for the same, I mean, yeah. for, for a long, long period of time. They're mm. like, oh, why am I not promoted? Yeah. How come this foreigner, you know, taking my job? How come yeah. this person can manage me? Mm. It's because they're not playing the game that they should Itui be playing. waiting. Yeah. So if it's not working for you, try something else. Mm. Keep trying something else until something works. So I think that's part of the changing jobs, right? Uh, so actually, I, I am now, a, I believe in the philosophy. So first of all, the changing jobs part, just to be clear, if it's like a toxic environment, it's not working, yeah, please change it yes, right away. Yes, absolutely. And if it's not working and it's not playing up to your strengths, definitely change the job. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Don't even hesitate. Mm. Mm. That's great. I, I think a great discussion. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and I hope that we can have more uh, discussions with you. Um, is there anything you want to plug like, when it comes to your social media? And stuff? Before I plug my social media accounts, yeah. I just thought I want to let you all know uh, how much the, these two guys have really supported me. Okay. okay, yeah. Because first of all, like when I started my own podcast, uh, Wei Chun was my first guest. We talked about Ikigai. If you want to listen to that, it's a really, really good episode. Um, there are clips also on TikTok and Instagram. Juliana Chan, PhD. The uh, Science of Work. That's the yeah, name the, of the, the podcast. podcast is called podcast, Science so. of Work. And also, Ray Ming, he helped me edit my LinkedIn Success Mindset ebook. So, without his edits, I couldn't launch my ebook. Like he sent you, but she actually paid me for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah that's that's okay. the point. Yeah. I, basically, the brief was um, Ray Ming, can you make it readable by <laughs> your audience? Because, you know, my academic writing may not work for, uh. for everyone. So, he helped me out a lot, break my long sentences. So I guess that's it. I just really want to thank the both of you. And if anyone wants to follow me, I've started doing skits on Instagram and TikTok, mostly work-related branding and LinkedIn, which I'm very active on. So Juliana Chan PhD is my is my moniker. Uh, Juliana Chan is taken by someone, okay? Oh, so that's why you add a PhD. Yeah, so oh, I wanted oh, to be oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, on LinkedIn, sorry. Right. Then uh, other than that, so I thought I'll be consistent. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, Juliana. Thank you, Wei Chun. And, uh, Thanks, Wei Ming. Yes, we yes, fun. In, in case we, we are so persuaded by the, the pros of remote work that our company drift further and further, but until we remote until we're no longer in the same company. And no, longer ends, yeah. and no longer friends. Yeah. No longer friends. Yeah. That will, this will be the final episode of the Work Side <laughs> podcast. Uh, but if not, we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for Tear joining drop. us. Teardrop. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.